Hi, everyone. Welcome. This is um, the Archer Gallery Art Talks. Um, and we are very lucky today to have artist V Maldonado here. Um, v is a multidisciplinary artist, freelance curator and writer who lives and works in Portland, Oregon. Um, born in 1976 in, oh, how do I pronounce that? How do you say it? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Mexico. Um, Maldonado, Maldonado grew up in the central San Joaquin Valley of California in a family of migrant field laborers. They, rece uh, they received their BFA in painting and drawing from the California College of Art, their MFA in painting and drawing from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and is exclusively represented by Froelich Gallery, Portland, Oregon. Maldonado's work is included in the permanent collections of the Portland Art Museum, the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon, um, the Tacoma Art Museum, Tacoma, Washington, and uh, as well as the Museum of Fine Art, Houston, Texas, and the Haley Ford Museum of Art in Salem, Oregon. Deploying both traditional media, including painting, printmaking, and drawing alongside contemporary strategy, strategies, such as performance, installation, and intervention, Maldonado expresses the power of identity to author experience and perception. So thank you, V, for being here, and um, I will let you um, take it away. Thank you so much, Kendra. Thank you, Carson. Thank you, Archer Gallery. Thank you all to the familiar faces that I see in the crowd. I love seeing you all. I'm sorry we can't be uh, together in the same room, but I will take this. Um, I have a, a big hole in my heart for community ever since I stopped working at, at PNCA. Uh, but I've been pouring myself into my work and uh, thankfully it's brought me back to you all. Uh, and so I just want to take a moment and recognize that uh, I'm uh, like many of you, like probably many of you there, a uh, settler on stolen lands here in uh, Northwest. I'm originally from Changitiro, Michoacan, as Kendra said, uh, Perapecha village, an indigenous village that got swept up in the North American kind of need for cheap free labor uh, from Mexicans. And that's my family, that's where I come from. Um, and like I was talking before we started uh, recording with one of the guests here, so much of my work has been around this idea of, you know, what I'm allowed or get away with saying as an artist. Um, and, and for a long time, that meant, you know, making art that looked like art, that, you know, was verifiable, that you would look at and be like, wow, you could really draw. That really looks like the person that you were looking at. Um, uh, or that looks like a sun, you know a sunset, or that looks like a Campbell soup can, or uh, even when I started working conceptually, you know it was about this world of known ideas. Um, uh, and I think eventually I got to a point in my life uh, where my lived experience as a queer indigenous person and my professional practice as an artist and an equity officer. You know, brought me up against this great wall uh, in society where the person that I had practiced being um, wasn't getting me to fulfillment. Uh, and, and I think being an artist and somebody who practices making their own choices, you know, I was seeking a deeper connection to myself, to my work, uh, to my community, to the environment. Um, and after a lot of internal work and transitioning uh, from cisgender male to uh, non-binary, I, I really began to come apart at the seams, y'all. Uh, I've been used to, I think, pointing and challenging systems around me, but really when I started turning the work of you know, equity towards myself, you know, that's when everything fell apart. And I think that's where I found my voice as an artist, uh, not in holding these worlds that I came from together, but by allowing the creative practice to uh, let go 
uh, to not need to confirm my biases or your biases as the audience about what you were experiencing or looking at in the work of art. Um, I was also working through a lot of lessons that I had given my students, y'all, where I think I taught for 15 years and saw a lot of amazing artists and designers be transformed by their work. And it wasn't until I started making the work that, uh, that you see there at Clark College um, that I really began to feel like I was moving in the right direction artistically. So what I wanna show you is um, a series of paintings that I started working on in 2019. Um, mm. Start here with uh, a painting that some of you may already be familiar with called The Fallen. Um, this was a, a really, in hindsight, a really important painting for me for a couple of reasons. Um, a, it was a return to painting after about a 10 year exodus from painting. I'd really largely spent my time after graduating uh, from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, rejecting painting from the bottom up. Um, and really there, there was no, I mean, even though I got my MFA in painting and drawing, I think it taught me that, you know, there, there, there was no good reason to make a painting in contemporary art. And so I explored performance, photography, um, conceptual art, and it's this practice of uh, somatic embodiment, ironically, that brought me right back to painting. Um, because I needed a medium where my body could be part of the medium. And as a conceptual artist, you know, my body was a problem. Uh, and it was something that I really largely had to divorce myself from, uh, especially when I did performances as Mad Max, which was, you know, an appropriated uh, Mexican wrestling mask uh, of Blue Demon that I would don whenever I would feel that I was in That's just done. white supremacist, <laughs> yeah. Is, La Junta. Um, Live, ahorita, no pasando ahorita. And here, I, when you, I'm, I'm picking up audio somebody else, so I apologize. Um, but this painting actually has images of that mask. And if, if you can look around, uh, you'll spot kind of different confrontations and melding of the Mexican wrestler, wrestling iconography I've been using. Um, and again, I, I, I pushed myself to monu kind of a monument monumental scale because I really wanted the lines themselves, the pigment that I was using to take on a kind of physical body. Um, this is actually included in uh, Many Wests, which is part of the University of Oregon Jordan Sister Museum's traveling exhibition uh, that's headed to the East Coast of the Smithsonian. Please go visit if you can, because again, it, it presents about 44 uh, kind of Northwest, largely native artists exploring ideas of you know, where we are uh, and, and the West being kind of one of the worlds that we exist in. You know, in this painting, I'm thinking a lot about the world that quote unquote, free and equal men live in uh, and the kind of clash and confrontation of civilizations that we see played out in these largely masculine structures and systems and histories. And again, I'm looking at these things as an artist uh, through an aesthetic lens of choice making. Uh, you know, if, if I don't have to think about what I'm painting, I can really focus on the medium of painting itself. And that's really where I think I start finding my voice, y'all is that by claiming space within the history of art, design, and painting, and then really sticking to my kind of method of kind of letting go of needing to hold on to the order of the world, guess what? The world dissolves in front of you. And so largely this figurative abstraction that you see is actually just a dissolving of my life and world as a creative person, as a parent, as a spouse. As, a, as, you know, as a son uh, who had transgressed masculinity. Um, 
You know, those are the kind of things MFA never prepared me for. And that's why I knew that I was heading in the right direction. My work was allowing me to engage my humanity in the deepest manner possible. Here. Oh, no, no, I don't wanna leave the meeting. I just want to, sorry y'all. Okay, so thinking about this environment of decomposition, um, I started returning to nature as a subject matter, um, but not as a subject matter merely to apprehend and render for the viewer, but to really look at nature as a teacher and a model for this transgressive world that I was becoming attuned to, not in a violent way, in the way that I'd been taught as a cis man to engage the world, but see you know, the dissolving of the world as, as a positive rupture. And that if I allowed myself to engage the natural world around me, I would learn how to navigate the world beyond the cis heteronormative binary that I'd become very comfortable in as a white passing uh, Mexican man uh, with a high education. So here I return the idea to, of the community garden, of the personal garden, uh, that oftentimes in history we see most recently rise up during the world wars to feed ourselves. Uh, and so I return to painting to feed my soul, to feed myself, uh, in a post-colonial manner. You know, I was no longer interested in sustaining the worlds of kings or queens or politicians uh, or of a gender normative marketplace that I was a part of as an artist. So really allowing myself to, you know, mix iconography, so floral motifs with figurative motifs and dissolving into each other. Here, I was imagining human bodies decomposing and dissolving uh, into kinds of nurse logs. Um, I also began to think about the kind of designed, like kind of uh, 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 simulated nature spaces that I had grown up with. Oh, for some reason. Sorry. Nope, I don't know what happened y'all. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. My apologies y'all. All right. So I'll go back to, now with Ofrenda, I was thinking about uh, these artificial nature spaces uh, that I, I consider altars. So really thinking of Ofrendas, which is something that I grew up uh, with as, as a kind of Mexican person, kind of the idea of home altars, um, giving me the ability to connect with ancestors. And so in this kind of post-colonial moment in my mind where I'm thinking about how do I connect with a sense of self and consistency divorced from these systems of oppression that had built so much certainty around my identity. And so when this painting as well uh, from 2019 Ofrenda, I'm thinking about creating that kind of altar space where um, Again, we, we can be transformed by having communion, communion with our ancestors. B, do you mind sharing your screen again? Oh, yeah. You know what? For some reason, I thought I had been sharing my screen. So sorry about that. So you guys didn't see Ofrenda. Give me a second. How about, how's that, Kendra? Can you see that? Okay. Yes. So with Ofrenda, really what I'm thinking about 
is how do I extend this nature space that I'm a part of and think about time and especially linear time outside of this idea of a human life where so much of what I think of human life, especially within capitalism is like, what is our life worth? How much labor is there really in our lives? Um, because I, I think largely uh, my, you know, the Mexican my, migrant experience that I'm a part of has really tarred, kind of showed me kind of the ends of the American dream. What you're looking at is actually uh, Sala Roja, uh, which is part of the Portland Art Museum permanent collection. Um, and Sala Roja is an interior uh, or a version of, of the interior of the home that I grew up in the Central Valley of California, which is a really kind of simple uh, ranch house. Oh, y'all, I don't know what's happening. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. That something happened that kicked me out on my side, y'all. I'm so sorry. It looks good to us. Okay. <laughs> on my end, everything went berserk, y'all. So give me a Kendra, what can you see now? Um, the video skipped a little bit, but we could see you now. Okay. And it's fine now, yeah, I think. Okay. Am I still sharing the screen? No, no. Nope. Okay. Try it one more time. Okay, yo. Apologies. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for your grace. Um, with Sala Roca, I am in it around the system of kind of binary gender that I saw my parents be trapped in. Um, you know, I went into this painting thinking I was going to make a painting judging the patriarchy, judging my father, you know, judging misogyny. But after I finished this painting, I really came away having a deeper understanding of the constraints that both me kind of had to face off with and how deeply trapped and confined they were by their Mexican Catholic upbringing. Um, and, and how, you know, there wasn't this saving moment ever. Uh, there wasn't a resolution ever. And that, you know, again, as, as this queer child of these Mexican parents, I found love for them in, in a deeper way than I think if I had just merely thought to understand them or know things about them. Um, and again, that's, that's what I'm, I'm talking about earlier when I said that I'm asking painting to bring me to parts of my humanity that I could get otherwise. Because um, it's easy, I think, to get caught up in who we're supposed to be, how we're supposed to act, you know, these ideas and images of ourselves that hold us and constrain us that honestly, as artists, can be the detriment of our creative practice because we grow and change and transform. Every time we touch the world, it touches us. Um, and so I wanted to take that newfound knowledge of somebody that had been an easy other, uh, uh, you know, for me growing up, which is the, the idea of, of the father figure. Um, and again, without the Mexican wrestling mask, I wanted to create a kind of engagement uh, and portrait of my father. Um, and I, I wanted to use the painting as a way to understand something about my father that I couldn't understand with painting. So I, I, I made this abstract portrait of him in his backyard garden, which is largely concrete with, uh, you know, uh, some, you know, plants growing around it, but it's this really desolate concrete backyard where he smokes his cigarettes and kind of sits with his own thoughts. And here he's under his prized lemon tree. You know, as a, as a field worker who got a third grade education, my father didn't have a lot of chances in the society. And, you know, he really needed his body to make a living for us. 
And now at an elder age, you really do see how used up we can be if, if we let society use us up. So for me, you know, y'all, I got exhausted as an art student looking at all those images in art history that didn't look anything like my family uh, or that didn't relate any of my upbringing. And so I wanted to make a painting that would take up as much space as possible in the white museums and you know white spaces of the world. Here I'm making this monumental painting thinking I'm gonna you know, be anti-establishment, but really I think it created this really intimate portrait of you know, a father uh, a son relationship that you know, isn't there anymore, that changed, that is changing. Um, and so I think the grit that some of the abstract elements have in my work also lend to that kind of, not just feeling of dissolution, but you know, that's how the world is. The world dissolves around us. It's always coming apart. We're always coming apart. It's why we need these beautiful, perfect images. Uh, we need them to be anchored in this uh, fantasy of time that we've created as colonized beings. Um, and, you know, with this portrait, I, I, I'm interested too in, you know, pushing back again on this idea of portraiture from the king's point of view, uh, from the queen's point of view, from the regent history that we all know. There's a reason why portraiture, uh, you know, moved in, in the direction it did. It, why everybody wants to have a selfie on Instagram now is, you know, imagining oneself and each other, that's powerful. But I think so much of what I wanna to express to you is that for indigenous Mexican people, you know, we're erased. We're erased people in history. We are constantly being erased. Every congressional cycle erases us more. Every congressional race, every political season makes footballs of Mexican and Latin American people. I mean, we are, you know, five, 600 years into colonialism, a couple of year, hundred years into nationalism, and you can't find us in history. We're erased. And so I wanted to give my audience a sense of what does it mean to ha have 500 years of erasure as your legacy, as your creative legacy? How do you express that? Like in a thousand years when art students study the history of the Northwest and they come upon this Mexican American queer indigenous artist in V. Maldonado, you know, how are they gonna tell that they came from 500 years of erasure? I don't know. I mean, I hope that in a thousand years we'd have our art historians that ask that question. It's my job to make the work now, um, to create that rupture, that question now. So I'm not interested in saying whatever I want. I need to ask new questions that humans in the future can offer and, and, and lend their thoughts and feelings and hearts to, because in the future, we're gonna have to practice being human in the way we're practicing being human today. And we need art that helps us practice being human. And so ultimately this large scale work that I've been making since 2019, 2018, since returning to painting is really about not authoring a perspective, but creating a human, a whole human, a whole human beyond the constraints of capitalism, of white supremacy, of ableism, right? Of anti-black racism that's all around us, right? How do we look at these systems and structures in history that ply us forward? Well, I don't know, but painting helps me. You know, painting helps me think about these cardinal directions that my spirit wants to move in, but then also lets me be in this physical plane of existence that's constantly limited. Um, and so again, I'm, I'm thinking about, for instance, in this uh, painting, um, being trapped, you know, being in this human field and this human cage and this human body, but not as a deficit, as an opportunity to explore and articulate and not just simply express and represent for the joy of the order, but to physically transgress my own self, to transform. And I think that's really what's different about the work that I make today 
you know, I'm not interested in changing your mind. I'm changing my mind. I'm not interested in changing you or telling you anything. Making this work helps me change and grow. And when I shared an exhibition, you know, it's not, it's not really there for you to confirm or affirm or purchase. There's just something about a big painting that human beings can't help but engage with. And now I really find myself looking for these opportunities to bring these paintings to new audiences because y'all feel the painting. When you're in front of them, I watch you. You know, you don't know what the hell to think these paintings are because there's not an indexical image. You know, I give you titles, I give you colors and forms, but largely I ask you to be curious and suspicious about this catastrophe that you're witnessing, that you're a part of, because you've normalized that in your daily life. Uh, and I know there's nothing I can do as an artist that can change who runs the world, who funds everything, right? I, there is no mark I can make. There's nothing I can teach you and tell you as an artist. You have to do that work yourself. Um, and I hope that by engaging directly with, for instance, the portrait of my mother, Amelia, La Huera, right? In my family, we all have three or four names, right? And La Huera, uh, one of my nicknames is El Huero, right? Because there's colorism in Mexican culture, right? Because we're also, you know, internalizing these systems of white supremacy as much as everybody else is. Uh, media plays such a important role in how we are shaped internally, externally, the ideas of ourselves and each other. You know, growing up, I watched my mother be this free radical who was rejecting the patriarchy, working as much as my dad, seeking a sense of autonomy for her body, for her mind. But everywhere around her were the constraints of a heteronormative patriarchy who hated women, who wanted to control them. And I could tell in, in everything that she did that she was trying to change herself to get free from those constraints. And so the portrait that's at Archer Gallery is actually one of my favorite paintings I've ever made, not because it's exemplary or because it has anything to do with our history, because again, it teaches me what a badass, like, Chola, my mom is, right? Like she tattoos her eyeliner so she, just, she can save time in the morning, right? Her lips are beautifully tattooed, right? Like she takes herself seriously and you know, looks matter. And so again, I, I find in the work that I do as a painter, as an artist, to be little about representation and more about taking up that space with, you know, my creator, my mother, her sisters, you know, my sister, her, my aunt mothers, right? Because by the way, you know, we have many people that raise us. And so if you do go to the gallery, you'll see uh, another portrait of my Madrina Felidonia, her sister, right? And I, I'm, I'm thinking about who really raises us, who really shapes us. Um, and the other painting that I have at Archer Gallery that I'd encourage you all to look at is Domingo Russo, because it is a, a way to, I think, meditate on this collective mourning that we all seem to be feeling, that we can't seem to name, that naming might be too painful, but you know, we've had a very difficult three years as a society. And I just, I, I know that we need art and artists now more than ever to give us space for our solace, but also just to think and feel through all the different emotions that, that we make. Um, and I'll leave it at that uh, because I want to make sure that you all have time to ask questions and we can engage more fully. So um, please, um, I'm not quite sure how we'll moderate picking folks for the question. Um, Kendra, do you want to pick folks? Yeah, I guess um, if anybody ha has a question, you could raise your hand or put it in the chat. I'm happy to read them from the chat too. I said a lot of things. Maybe some of the things that I said sparked something in your mind. Maybe I, I have said something that you'd like me to finish my thought. Now is your opportunity. <laughs> so uh, my question is, do you have a process as you're painting? I mean, do you start with doing 
the sketches of people who are just moving the brush around? I mean, is there a way that you work or does it change every time? Great question, Carson. Um, yeah, I mean, even when I'm not painting, I'm painting. For those 10 years that I took a hiatus from painting, Carson, I was painting. But I was exploring that choice making and gesture making in a different way. So, you know, and it, it goes in fits and starts. So by the time I get into my studio, I don't have to think about what I'm doing. I can just physically be in my body, grab, you know, I don't use brushes. I paint right out of the tube. And then I, I have, I have wood, uh, uh, basically palette knives that I use to take the paint away. Because again, what I'm interested in is not showing you something, but expressing this legacy of erasure that Mexican indigenous and queer people have had to endure since colonialism and especially under nationalism. I don't know how to do that, Carson. So I think I'm still practicing that. So every time I go to my studio or to make a painting, I'm thinking, how do I make a mark that shows you how much erasure is around you, how much editing goes on? Uh, and it changes, friend. It changes from painting to painting. Um, but I try to make all the choices before I start. So palette, uh, you know, amount of time I'll spend on it, subject matter. Subject matter is, is, is delicate because process is my main subject. So really, I think like if I was going to paint, you know, for instance, uh, a portrait of somebody, it would have to align with this need to think about, you know, painting in general. Uh, so a lot of things have to line up. I see Zoe with a hand up, or I, again, I, sorry for anybody that already had their hand up. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm actually one, I'm a postgraduate fellow at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. Um, <laughs> and I've had the complete pleasure of introducing students to your work, um, in particular the fall and because it's in our collection. Um, and I've had a lot of really great conversations like as a non-binary person myself with other students who identify as trans. Um, and something I've noticed consistently, um, in particular with the Fallen, is how students see more the more that they look at it. So they, at first they don't see the body of the wrestler, or sometimes they don't even see the mask. Sometimes they just see the foot. Um, and I was wondering if that viewer process of finding more in your work is a purposeful choice or if it's just kind of part of your process and it's just a happy, maybe it's just a happy accident. I don't know. Oh, I mean, that, that's, that's a wonderful question because I, again, I think my primary activity, Zoe, is creating a lived experience through the painting. It's not that I'm rejecting representationalism. It's that representationalism is the status quo. Uh, and I'm less interested in confirming your bias about what you're looking at. And so I'm asking myself to look more deeply as I paint because I know how difficult looking is. When I walk in the world, even though I have my name, my pronouns, Zoe, the world puts pressure on me. It calls me things, right? It wants to shape me into something it wants. And as a creative art, as an artist, honestly, as an artist, I don't want to be shaped by the white supremacist heteronormative patriarchy. It creates toxicity and disease in my body. And it makes me, you know, do violence on myself my the people around me and the environment, right? So how do I learn how to do something else? So I know, so one of the things my MFA taught me is that seeing is impossible. It's quite difficult. And you really have to be intentional and you have to look to see as Carrie James Marshall always reminds us, look to see, look to see. Hamza Walker was one of my mentors in, at SAIC, and it was one of the things he really brought me to. Um, and so 
I also know how busy people are. You know, somebody who's worked in the museum and gallery world for a long time, people don't really want to look. It's kind of a burden to look. Like they don't want to look if it's really important, if it's meaningful, right? For me, I still want to engage in that mesmeric activity of holding your gaze. And I think, again, that's, that's a holdout. I think it, it's almost why I returned to painting because I need something to hold my activity long enough. Because honestly, as a queer trans person, I don't want to finish things. I'm not interested in finishing things. I'm interested in starting things and making them go. I'm not interested in finalizing things, right? That's, that's no. Um, but that's the conundrum. That's the paradox in painting. And I, and I think that's what, that's where I, I, you know, again, making a painting is stopping making a painting. Uh, so going back to Carson's question about process. So I'm always painting, but I'm not always holding on to traditional painting materials. And then I have to decide I have to stop now. So this thing can have its own legs. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm somebody that, that thinks that if you're a living artist, you know, you can change and grow. And so that's, I think that's, that's part of the, 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 the conflict and the mesmerizing thing that happens is like, how long can I keep this going? Uh, Cause it's, it's not sustainable. It's sustaining so far as you know, it's, it, it's, it's, you know, it's four or five years into the practice. So I know it's sustaining, but I've never felt that it's sustainable. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you so much. Looks I like can't see all the hands can, uh, can- It looks like Danielle has a question. And I thought Angela too had, oh, somebody else. Okay, so Danielle, go ahead. Hey, thanks for Hi, another great talk. It's always wonderful to hear you talk about your work. And I know um, one of the things that I've seen you share on social media is about um, being a distance runner. And I think your letterpress residency recently, I saw that you're working on a poem that was addressing endurance running. And so to hear you talk about painting and being in your body and the physicality of that practice, and then thinking about the physicality of, of running. And um, so I was just curious if there was more you could share about if those things relate for you or how, how they inform one another or serve you between running and making art. You, you know, I, I thank you for that question, Danielle, because again, I think Kendra kind of in my intro covered my varied practice. Um, so, you know, being an artist and, and making a painting is not one thing. And for me, like Danielle said, you know, endurance sports are really important fonts for me. It's, so endurance sports is how I fill my cup up. Um, it, it's one of the daily practices I have for plugging into ancestors that I carry in body. Uh, ideas that I'm so busy during my day to think about and, and emotions to feel about that, you know, in this, this, you know, minute by minute day that we all live, you just don't get to. So, you know, for me, the athletic practice is part of the creative practice and it's all about practice. It's all about daily practice. Um, and, you know, returning to painting is exhausting. Painting is exhausting, y'all. I find painting to be exhausting. I am exhausted by the time I'm done with a painting, whether it be a small watercolor. Honestly, y'all, small watercolors, more emotional labor than, than I could, you know, I, I went small thinking this will be easier. No, right? And so for me, Danielle, you know, the endurance running is a way to balance the emotional labor of being an artist, a queer person who's constantly anxious, right? I, I think as a cis man, I was always anxious. I wasn't man enough for all the men in the room and, you know, all the cis women. And, and so now it's just like, I'm exhausted, right? So that, that running for me is a way to charge my battery, but also to get into the physical state that I find when I'm actually making the work, Daniel. It's, it's very similar. Um, it's technique that I'm focusing on. I'm focusing on breathing. So going back to Carson's questions about technique. So y'all, you know, each 
each color line, each 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 passage is it's about a breath long, right? So I breathe as I paint. I'm really thinking about you know breath to movement. It just looks like it took 30 seconds to make, but really it's two months of breathing. And so what you're looking at might not be a sentient object, but it comes from a living thing trying to imagine itself be beyond the, 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 the kind of limitations that we have in this society for the self. And Danielle, you've heard me talk about this too. So painting allows me to connect with ancestors, not just art historical ancestors, uh, but indigenous ancestors, ancestors again, that don't didn't leave these big you know monuments or histories that I have to uncover. And so I find that endurance running and writing, writing haikus, writing poetry helps me do that self excavation, right? That goes back to I think uh, the idea that I brought up with Zoe, where it's only in that excavating space right, that we can really reach that mesmerize, like that mesmerizing state of like, we don't know what we're going to find. It's how we know we're heading in the right direction because we keep sifting, we keep looking, right? And, and I also often think about archaeologists digging down into the earth. How do they know, you know, what not to dig through, right? And so again, I think for me, endurance uh, running gives me a way to output so that when I come back into the studio, it's back into the input. Does that make sense, Daniel? Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing. And my apologies too that I have to leave soon for another meeting. So if I disappear, uh, <laughs> this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. No, you're good. You're good. Um, there's a question in the chat. Do you want me to read it? Please, yes. Okay. So this is from Dinara. Um, it says, I love your enthusiasm, V. I myself am really into abstract art and really appreciate your approach to the world through your perspective. When you feel uninspired, what do you do? And as a student studying design, I am constantly thinking of how am I going to make ends meet? What would be your advice on staying financially stable uh, with creating art and design? So it's kind of two questions for you. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I would say, you know, one of the reasons I went to art school, Dinara, is because I thought I would run out of inspiration, uh, that I would run out of ideas or motivation. Uh, but I would say is that that didn't happen. Uh, I really love making things in the world. I'm, I'm in love with the idea of touching the world and transforming it, molding it. Again, as I, I haven't known a lot, as a person all my life, but I've always known I wanted to be an artist because I wanted to be responsible for my own choices, right? So whenever I'm feeling uninspired, I just really focus on making my own choice. I'm not gonna make anything today. I'm gonna take 10 days off from making anything. I'm not going to beat myself up for not, you know, making something, you know, V's always posting something on Instagram, F them, right? I'm not, I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to decide to turn off the world and turn in, tune into myself for those 10 days, right? I'll, I'll tell you, when you make intentional choices about what you want to do, very specific, you don't need inspiration. You, you, wrote, you wrote the instructions out. You told yourself what to do. So it's something that I learned as like a conceptual performance artist. Like you don't have to be inspired to make art. You don't. And I, I think one of the things that, you know, I, I, I largely, I hated art school, by the way, y'all. Denara, I hated being an art student, by the way. That was the hardest part about being an artist. I, I, I didn't like art school until I started teaching and was a dean. I loved it. I loved, you know, because again, I, I was able to shape it, right? So again, and going back to your question about making living, making that and me, you know, we live in, again, in capitalism under white supremacy. You know, our labor is not free and equal, right? It just, we're all going to be paid based on two things: nepotism and plagiarism. Uh, you know, it's it's a thumb, it's a thumbnail that I drew up for my professional practice students. But the art and design world is just nepotism and plagiarism. It's who you know and what you know. Right, so it's like, who's in your Rolodex, right? So if, if you don't know anybody in the design world, you're not gonna get a job in the design world. 
I don't know. If you don't know anybody who shows in a gallery, you're probably not going to show in a gallery. You know, a bunch of people who make NFTs, you're probably going to make an NFT, right? Like, again, and, you know, I came from four generations of field workers. So for almost 100 years, my family only picked grapes, only picked apples. That's all we did. Every six months, we'd go back and forth, right? So like you, I was asking to do something else with my life, right? And, and like I said, we live in capitalism, y'all, right? We all know that. So first rule is never, ever, ever beat yourself up for paying your bills however you can even if it's not doing designer artwork. Because really only framers make money in the art world, right? And only a certain amount of people actually make a living in the design world because it has such high overhead, right? It's mostly just about like prestige and like status, right? So I would say, think about like what you need from the art design world. Do you need money, prestige or status, right? Um, and again, go back to that rule of nepotism and plagiarism, right? So once you figure out if you need money, status, or power, I need all three. I don't know. You might need all three too. Then you think about who do I know in that world? How do they get money, power, and prestige? What, what, what do they, they have? To, I think that's where like the art history classes that we get taught. Um, I wish we'd had a lot more like business art history and design art history classes because I had to self-teach myself business practices uh to not make like capitalism the the boogeyman right it's not a thing like so okay i said capitalism white supremacy all these things it's just us it's just humans right so again i'm thinking about like do you have a mentor uh i i haven't been able to get where i am without mentors right in in undergrad and graduate school but professionally i've had me i've had mentors not a lot then are you don't you, you you don't need that many right you need a mentor that wants you to succeed never ever ever settle for a mentor that settles for you to fail that's that's not a mentor that's a gatekeeper okay so you need to lean into finding folks that you feel comfortable asking questions that the internet won't give you right uh, because if you can find the answers on the internet don't waste people's time with it they're trying to figure out how to make ends meet too does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Listen, I and and I look at my Instagram. I have eight pieces of advice for you in terms of if you do want to be a working artist, it, it's, it comes from 15 years of working with amazing creative artists who did want to monetize what they're doing. Um, and it starts with you being as intentional as possible. I hope that helps. Yeah, it helps so much. Thank you, Pete. Absolutely. Thank you for making your work. Are there any other questions? We're up against the hour, so. And I'm long-winded, y'all, so come on. <laughs> All right, well, um, Right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, V, for um, talking with us. This is wonderful. Um, uh, I will put this on the website very soon. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you all for making it today. I love seeing your names and faces. Oh, Davy, look at you now. <laughs> oh, my God, Fred, who's that? This is Tippy. Hi, Victor. Oh, good to see you. Fred. I go by V now. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, oh, Tippy! Oh my goodness, I love that. Oh, I'm gonna spot. I'm gonna spotlight you, Damien, so everyone can see your dog real quick. Okay, so, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs>